we were discussing about agents of pollination in that in the previous lectures we covered pollination by wind which is called as anemophily pollination by water which is called as hydrophily means we finish the abiotic agents coming to the biotic pollination so the common type of biotic pollination is by insects insects are predominant right so we tell 10 uh, 7 out of 10 animals are insects only so among biotic agents which help in pollination of the flower are the insects and insect pollination is called entomophily so our today's topic is entomophily come on tell me what do you mean by entom entom means it is insect and philly means to love right so, altogether, what is entomophily means pollination through insects or pollination by insects. Okay, it is pollination by insects. And insect comes under biotic agent. So, it comes under biotic pollination. It comes under biotic agent of pollination. And among the biotic agents, this is the most common type. Different biotic agents are there, right? Birds will do pollination, ants will do pollination, bats will do pollination, snails, squirrels, even snakes. So, among all that we have listed, insect pollination is the most common type. So, entomophily is the most common type of pollination. So, we can make a statement that 80% of the plant species get pollinated by insect. We can make a statement that 80% of the flowering plants, 80% of the flowering plants get pollinated by insects, we can tell. They get pollinated by insects. Now, in the previous lectures also we discussed like if a flower has to participate in hydrophily, what are the adaptations or what are the characteristics that hydrophilus flower should exhibit? Now, we are going to discuss what are the characteristics that an entomophilus flower should exhibit. Now, flower, um, insects will be flying at very high. Now, the flower should be visible to the insect which is flying very high means it should be colorful so that the insect gets attracted or if it is small, it should make itself prominent by gathering or grouping to make an inflorescence. So, that is one character. What is the first character we are telling? It should be colorful and it should be conspicuous. It should be visible, right? Then next character if you have to discuss, when we are talking about color, you know peculiar color is attracted by peculiar type of insect. Now, what are the insects which come under pollination means? Moth will help in pollination. Butterflies, wasps, bees and beetles are the insects which commonly participate in pollination. What are the insects children? The insects which help in pollination are moth we can tell, wasps we can tell, butterfly, right? So, moth, wasp, butterfly, beetles. So, these are the common type of agents, beetles and bees also. These are the common type of agent, agents which help in pollination. Now, when we have to talk about the characteristics, characteristics of entomophilus flowers, characteristics of entomophilus flowers, as I told you, the first character should be, the flower should be colorful so that it gets attracted by the insect. So, let us write on, flowers should be colorful. They should be colorful to attract insects. So, this is one adaptation. And when we are talking about the colors, we can tell like moth visits white flowers generally, bees visits blue and yellow color flowers, butterflies and wasps visit red color flowers, means color is also specific for the insect. We can tell moths visit Okay, moths visit which type of flowers? Whitish flowers. So, whereas if we tell bees, bees visit blue or yellow color flowers. 
visit blue or yellow or purple color flowers and we can tell that butterflies and wasps visit reddish flowers butter flies and wasps they visit which color flowers they visit reddish color flowers so all together this comes under one characteristic that we are telling that flower should be colorful so that they get attracted by the insect now means we are telling that flower should be showy it should be attractive there are some flowers which are not attractive they are dull if the flower is dull then how will the insect gets attracted means the other parts of the flower become colorful we are telling that the flowers should be showy means attractive if the flowers are dull if the flowers are dull then come on tell me if the flowers are dull then the other parts of the flower should be attractive then the other parts of flower become attractive now let us see what did we write on the board take a screenshot then we will come back so we are talking about a common type of biotic pollination which is entomophily enton means insect pollination by insects is called as entomophily it comes under biotic agent now among the biotic pollinations this is a common type of pollination we can tell that 80% of the flowering plants means will be pollinated by insects only which type of insects participate in insect pollination moths butterflies wasps bees and beetles participate in insect pollination what are the characteristics or adaptations that a insect pollinated flower will show in order to attract the insect the flower should be colorful now moth gets attracted towards whitish flowers bees gets attracted towards blue color or yellow color or purple color flowers butterflies and wasps gets attracted towards reddish flowers if the flower is not colorful if the flower is dull then the other parts become attractive take a screenshot we will draw again we'll write again right now what parts of the flower get become attractive we will see have you seen bougainvillea plant it is a common plant right so we also call it as paper plant now bougainvillea plant the flowers are very dull very small tiny flowers white color flowers not at all attractive but it has to undergo insect pollination so then the bracts of the flowers get modified into colorful structures so the flower of bougainvillea is very small and it is whitish this much small flowers are there and whitish dull color flowers then flower cannot be identified by the insect then what happens i am telling the bract gets modified into a petal like structure to get visible so this is the bract which becomes a colorful structure so that it becomes prominent so that the insect can identify so what are these these are the bracts where do you find it we find it in bougainvillea the bracts are modified petaloid bracts we can tell they are petaloid bracts petal like bracts and if you take euphorbia plant in euphorbia plant also the flower is very small and it's not conspicuous it is not visible then the leaves become attractive in euphorbia leaves of euphorbia become attractive they become attractive now again in euphorbia if we see the main flower will be like this this itself is the flower now surrounding the flower the leaves get modified into flower like structures okay so this is a leaf don't think it is a flower the actual flower is inside it will be like a bunch google and see you can find euphorbia flowers or euphorbia plants so what i am drawing is not the leaf uh, flower it is the leaf 
so these are the leaves which are appearing like flowers to attract the insects and if we take musandra in that plant one sepal is modified into very attractive big petal like structure so one sepal is modified is modified into attractive structure where in musandra now in musandra if we see the flowers are star shaped and very small flowers they are i think the dot still big the flowers will be very small than this so then the leaf gets modified into uh, we are telling one sepal gets modified into a attractive structure so when the sepal gets modified into attractive structure then the insect comes and near to that it locate the flower so what is this sepal the sepal becomes attractive in musandra leaf gets attractive in euphorbia bract gets modified in bougainvillea and have you noticed mimosa pudica touch me not plant or acacia plant in that plant the stamens of the flower become colorful so in mimosa and acacia mimosa is one plant acacia the stamens are attractive the stamens are attractive if you have noticed mimosa pudica means touch me not plant so in that plant like this it will be there now the stamens will be beautiful pink colored like a bunch like a ball in all directions they will come very much prompt so then the insects come getting attracted to the stamens so all these are the attractive structures if the flower is dull then all these are the parts which get modified to attract the insects now we are telling the flowers are colorful now coming to the third point flowers are colorful they have they produce nectar they produce odor coming to the odor some flowers produce fragrant odor some flowers produce foul odor some flowers produce fragrant odor and some flowers produce foul odor now which flowers produce fragrant odor fragrant odor is produced by night blooming plants like jasmine night queen like that night blooming flowers come on what are the examples of night blooming flowers jasmine night queen right now these plants they will be white color is not required because in dark only white color is prominent right so then how will the insect locate it that there is a flower here so because of its fragrance the insect identifies goes and it helps in pollination whereas some other plants will be there they secrete foul odors for example if you take rafflesia one is rafflesia plant rotten meat smell it gives rotten meat smell it gives now this rotten meat smell is attracted by its pollinator the pollinator is carrion fly carrion fly can identify only the rotten meat it likes that smell so there is why rafflesia in order to get pollinated by that fly it gives rotten meat fly uh, smell next one is arum plant now arum plant it gives human dung smell it produces human dung smell to get pollinated by beetles to get pollinated by which insect it is beetles and one more plant is there aristolochia aristolochia will smell like a decaying tobacco or decaying humus aristolochia will smell like a decaying tobacco decaying tobacco or like a decaying humus again it is attracted by beetles to get attracted by beetles children the first point we wrote it should be colorful and if the flower is not colorful if it is dull then the other parts are colorful that is our second point 
the third point we are telling the flowers will produce fragrance okay under fragrance we told uh, some plants will give pleasant fragrance some plants will give foul smell pleasant fragrance we go with jasmine and night queen which are night blooming flowers foul smell three examples are taken one is rafflesia next one is arum next one is aristolesia rafflesia will smell like a spoiled meat so to get identified by carry on fly arum smells like a human dung to get identified by beetle aristolecia smells like decaying tobacco to get identified by beetles and this plant mimosa and acacia the stamens become attractive to be identified by the insect in bougainvillea the bracts are petal like to be identified by the insects in euphorbia the leaves become attractive in musendra one sepal becomes very big and attractive take a screenshot we will continue right now the fourth point will be the fourth adaptation or fourth characteristic will be flowers should be conspicuous means they should be visible if the flower is tiny then it will gather together it will group together to make an inflorescence so under that we can take head inflorescence advanced type of racemose inflorescence right sunflower is an example marigold is an example for uh, compact inflorescences so the fourth point we can tell that flowers are large flowers are large if the flower is small if flower is small then they make an inflorescence then they make an inflorescence we can go with a head inflorescence which is called as capitulum head is also called capitulum inflorescence example for head inflorescence is sunflower we are going with sunflower in the sunflower this is the base on which these are the flow one type of florets and this is the disc floret since the flowers are compactly arranged we call it as a compact head inflorescence advanced type of racemose inflorescence so these florets are called as disc florets and these are called as ray florets now when the insect comes this is one don't think it's one petal it is one flower when the insect comes now at a time it can pollinate so many flowers if the insect comes and lands here if the insect comes and lands here at a time it can pollinate many flowers so this is one characteristic if the flower is small then it will gather together to make an inflorescence now why will the insect visit the flower either for the nectar or for the edible pollinates or for the shelter now the insects visit flowers why do they visit the flowers they visit the flowers for their nectar or they visit the flowers for shelter or they visit for the edible pollen grains now what are the plants which give edible pollen grains for the insect to eat rose pollen grains are edible clematis pollen grains are also edible magnolia pollen grains are also edible if we have to talk about edible pollens so i told rosa rosa indica rose plant pollen grains are edible next one is clematis pollen grains are edible magnolia pollen grains are edible so the insect will come to collect the edible pollen grains then if the insect has to come to take the pollen grains what should be the positioning of the stamens or the pistils so when the insect is coming and sitting on the flower now the stamen should be inside so that it can collect the pollen grains and the stigma also should be inside if the stamen and stigma are inside very much within the flower we use a word called inserted and like hibiscus if the stamen and pistil are outside the flower that's called exserted so here since the insect has to sit and collect the pollen grains on its body the pollen grains will be sticky so we can tell that the stamens and stigma are inserted the stamens 
and stigma are inserted type. What do you mean by inserted type? Stamens and stigma are within the flower. The stamens and stigma are within the flower itself. They are not well exposed outside. So that when the insect comes and sits on it, it will collect the pollen grains. And next one we told that the insect is coming to collect the edible pollen grains or the insect is coming to collect the nectar. So then flowers should produce nectar, right? Flowers should produce nectar. So we call them as nectaries. Nectar producing parts are called nectaries. And so nectaries, where are they usually located? Nectaries are located at the bottom of the flower, at the base of the ovary, so that the insect tries to go inside. When it is growing inside, then it can easily pick the pollen grains on its body. Flowers should produce nectar. The cells which are producing nectar are called as nectaries and the nectaries, where are they located? They are located usually at the base near the ovary so that when the insect goes inside, it can pick the pollen grain. And again, there will be some markings on the uh, flower to guide the insect towards the nectar. So, they are called nectar guides. Some flowers. Some flowers, if we go with antirhinum, some flowers like antirhinum, they have nectar guides also to direct the insect towards the nectar. They have nectar guides. They have nectar guides. If you see the flower, right, here is the flower and these are the stamens pistil right this is the pistil and the nectaries are here these are the nectaries now on the flower it has hair like structures or it has antirhinum has hair like structures so now the insect has an indication that it has to pass through this to reach the nectaries and the insect will be coming inside like this the insect when it comes inside so, on its path towards the nectaries, some stamens will be there. So, this is one stamen. From this stamen, it picks the pollen grains on its body. So, first point, what did we discuss? For entomophilus flowers, they should be colourful. Second point, we told, if they are not colourful, then at least the other part should be colourful. Third point, we told, they should produce odour. Some will produce pleasant odour, some will produce foul odour. Fourth point, we told, flowers should be conspicuous, visible. If they are not conspicuous, then at least they should gather together to make an inflorescence. There we talked about sunflower, capitulum, head inflorescence. Next, insect visits the flower either to collect nectar or to collect edible pollinants or for shelter. Now, the plants which give edible pollens are Rosa indica is one plant, Clematis is another plant, Magnolia is other plant. And stamens and stigma should not be exerted outside the flower. They should be well within inside so that when the insect sits, pollen grains can be dropped on it. And later when it goes to the other flower, it can, when it is uh, moving its wings, the pollen grains which are sticky falls on that stigma. So that condition is called inserted type. Next one, the flower should produce nectar. The nectar producing cells are called nectaries. Positioning of nectaries will be at the base so that the insect comes inside. On its path, it will meet the stamens. From there, it will pick the pollen grains on its body. Take a screenshot. We will continue. Right? Now, eighth point we need to discuss. Correct? So, always I am telling that the pollen grains are sticky, they go and stick on the body of the insect. So, our eighth point will be, the pollen grains are sticky. The pollen grains are sticky. And the insects, they have pollen baskets on their legs to collect the pollen grains. Pollen grains are sticky and the insects, what do they have? They have 
fallen baskets. Insects will have fallen baskets to collect the pollen grains. To collect the pollen grains. Where are the pollen baskets present children? They are present on the legs of the insect. So, this is another characteristic. Now, next we can tell that some flowers provide safe places for the insect to lay the eggs. This is an interesting thing, right? Some flowers will provide space for the insect to lay eggs. They are so much dependent on each other means if the flower is not there then the insect cannot lay its eggs that means it cannot complete its life cycle and the insect is not coming towards the flower then the flower also will not get fertilized it will not it also will not complete its life cycle so they are interdependent on each other under this we can see three beautiful examples so one example is yucca flower one example is yucca flower yucca flower is pollinated by a moth the name of the moth is called as pronuba moth. What is the name of the moth? The name of the moth is called as pronuba yukicella or we can also call it as tegitecula yukicella. Now this is the plant tegitecula yucca, yeah it is yucca cella. Tegitecula yucca cella, which is also called pronuba yucca cella. This is the moth. Now, this moth comes towards the yucca plant to lay the eggs. Now, when we see the flower, this is the stamen. This is the ovary, style and stigma. And here are the pollen grains. This is the petal and this here is the sepal. Now, the moth will come to lay the eggs. So, where it will lay the eggs? In order to lay the eggs, it will make a hole. It will make a hole inside the ovary. So, it has drilled the ovary like this. It will drill the ovary and it will come and lay the eggs. So, the moth will come and it is laying the eggs here. So, what are these structures? These are the eggs of the moth. So, moth has drilled the ovary and it has laid the eggs here. After laying the eggs, it want to seal the gap. So, in order to seal the gap, it will fly around, it will pick the pollen grains and then it using that pollen grains, it will seal it. So, then how it will seal this? It will seal it with the collected pollens from the surrounding. So, what is there inside? Ovule is there inside. Ovule has egg and these are the male gametes. So, Moth has brought the male gametes very much vicinity with the female gamete egg leads in fertilization. So, the yucca plant got pollinated. Now, what benefit the plant, uh, the moth will get? Moth has laid its eggs inside and when the eggs hatch out and the young ones comes out, it nicely takes the nourishment from the flower and then it comes out. So, this is an interesting example. Another example we see, it is ficus carica. Right? So, this is a fig plant and this is pollinated by wasp. The name of the wasp is called Blastophaga. The name of the wasp is called Blastophaga. Fig has hypanthodium inflorescence. Fig has which inflorescence? It has hypanthodium inflorescence. Now, if we see the hypanthodium inflorescence, I am drawing it little big. There is a small orifice here which has hair to guide the insect towards the flask. So, this is orifice and inside it has a unisexual flask. On the top it has male flask, at the bottom it has fertile female flask. So, these are male flowers. We will symbolize them with stamens. These are male flowers and the fertile female flowers will be at the bottom.
this is a fertile female flower which has terminal style and stigma. Now what are these? These are male flowers and what are these? These are fertile female flowers. Now in between these fertile female flowers lie the sterile flowers which are called gall flowers. Now gall flower will be like this. Gall flower will have a lateral style like this. So if you have to draw the gall flower, gall flower, this, if this is the ovary, it has a curve and it has a lateral style. Now this is, what is this? This is called gall flower. Now what do you mean by gall flower? It is sterile female flower. It is sterile female flower. Now this gall flower, it is having lateral style, right? Whereas if we see the fertile female flowers, fertile female flower if this is ovary and it has terminal style and stigma. What is this? This is fertile female flower. So it has terminal style. It has terminal style. Now like this we have gall flowers. Now the insect comes inside. The insect is coming inside, right? The insect comes inside, why it is coming inside? To lay the eggs. Where it will lay the eggs? It will lay the eggs in this groove. So what are these? These are the eggs of the wasp, blastophaga. It lays eggs in the groove of the sterile gall flower. Anyway, gall flowers will not get fertilized, they are sterile only. So insect is using it, no problem for the flower at all. Now. It will go lay the eggs. While it is going out, it picks the pollen grains on its body. While it is going out, from these male flowers, it picks the pollen grains on its body. When it goes into the other flower, it will drop the pollen grains there. So we are talking about some interesting examples. We are telling that some flowers even provide spaces for the insects to lay the eggs. One example we have seen yucca flower, uh, pollinated by a moth which is called Pronuba yucca cella. Another plant we are seeing, fig plant, ficus carica, which is pollinated by a wasp called blastophaga. One more example is there, which is called amorphophilus. Amorphophilus is the tallest flower. Now, you know it is 6 feet. The flower or the inflorescence will be 6 feet height. Now, when the flower or inflorescence is such tall, why can't it give space for the insects to lay the eggs? So, it gives space for the wasps to lay eggs. It gives space for wasps to lay eggs. So, here in this board, we covered two points or three points. The first point we told the pollen grains are sticky and that sticky pollens, they will attach, uh, they will stick to the body of the insect or the insect will have pollen baskets on their legs where they can pick the sticky pollen grains. And then we are telling the flowers can even provide space for the insect to lay the eggs. Under that yucca flower we have seen, fig flower we have seen and amorphophilus we have seen. Take a screenshot, we will continue. Yes. Another interesting example goes with an orchid plant called Ophirus. Now, what is the name of the orchid plant? It is Ophirus. Now, one petal of this Ophirus flower, it has an uncanny resemblance like a female insect. Now, the male insect, actually here, the insect, the male insects are protandrous, means males will mature first. So, the male, thinking that it is not a flower, it thinks it is a female insect and it goes for copulation. It goes and sits on the flower thinking it is female insect, then it will pick the pollen grains. What is this mechanism called? Pseudo copulation. So I think our tenth point will be pseudo copulation. It is called sexual deceit. So it is called sexual deceit. It is exhibited by an orchid plant. The name of the orchid plant is Ophirus, okay. This flower, one petal of the flower, one petal of the flower has uncanny resemblance like a 
female insect in its size, shape and color. So, the Ophiris, one petal of the flower has uncanny resemblance. It has uncanny resemblance like female insect. Now, what happens? Then the male insect will come. Male insect will come, sits on the flower thinking that it is a female insect and it will not lead in copulation. So, that is why we are calling it as pseudo copulation. In turn, the flower is getting pollinated. So, this is one example. Pseudo copulation, the plant is orchid. Its name is Ophirus. So, the name of the insect is called Kalpa. The name of the insect is called Kalpa. So, we should be careful. Like, uh, there are some insects which come and uh, they rob the pollen grains also. So, they are called as pollen robbers. Some insects, some insects are pollen robbers means they collect the pollens they eat of the pollens but they don't help in pollination some pollens are some insects are pollen robbers they eat off the pollen grains but do not pollinate they do not pollinate okay so this also the plant should be careful and Insects are helping flowers in many ways by doing pollination. So, in order to uh, sustain the insect uh, visits again and again, the flower has to provide floral rewards. The flower has to provide floral rewards. Why the flower has to provide floral rewards? To sustain animal visits. To sustain animal visits. In order to sustain animal visit, if the insect has to come again and again, then the flower has to give floral rewards in terms of edible pollen grains, in terms of nectar, in terms of providing space to lay eggs, providing space to lay eggs. So, this is about floral rewards. And then we can talk about an another interesting example which is there in salvia. So, we call it as liver mechanism. It is also called as turn <coughs> pipe mechanism. Liver mechanism is also called as turn pipe mechanism. Salvia plant belongs to a family called labiate. Labiate means the flower appears like a lips. The flower will be like this. Now, what happens here means in this structure, if we have to draw the pistil, this is stigma, style and ovary. And where are the stamens? Usually, we tell these are the anther lobes and these two are connected by a sterile connective tissue like this. Now, whereas in labiate, the anther lobes will be well separated from each other because the connective is long. This is one anther lobe, this is another anther lobe and this is a connective. Now, if you place such a type of structure inside the flower, so one anther is like this, the other anther is like this. Among these two anther lobes, one anther lobe is a fertile anther lobe, the other one is a sterile anther lobe. So, this anther lobe is fertile anther, whereas this one is sterile anther. Now, then the insect comes. The insect comes. Why is the insect coming? To take the nectar. Where are the nectar is present? The nectars are present at the base. Here are the nectar present. So, nectar is present. So, the insect comes and sits. The insect comes. This is a sterile anther. The insect comes and sits on the sterile anther to take the nectar. To take the nectar from here. So when the insect comes and sticks on the anther. Now this is one anther lobe and this is the other anther lobe. When insect is coming and sitting here like a liver mechanism, this anther bends on it. 
and it drops the pollen grains on the body of the insect in this manner. Now, when the insect comes and sits on the sterile lobe, then the fertile anther, from the fertile anther, like a liver mechanism, so this comes and drops the pollen grains on the body. It comes and drops the pollen grains on the body. Then the insect will fly off. It will go on to another flower. There on the flower, again it will sit on the sterile lobe to collect the nectar. Now, when it flies, on its wings, on its bodies, pollen grains are there, which it collected from the previous flower. Will go and be deposited on the stigma. Will go and deposit on the stigma. It helps in pollination. So this mechanism is called sal in salvia. The mechanism is called liver mechanism, which is also called turn pipe. The pipe is turning and dropping the pollen grains. Turn pipe mechanism. So if you see how many interesting adaptations the plants will show in nature, if you carefully observe. So, we get amazed looking at all these interesting examples. All this is about insect pollination. In the next class, we will talk about the remaining agents of zoophily, like ants also help in pollination, bats also help in pollination, squirrels also, birds also. All that we will cover in the next class. I hope the class is interesting. If you like the channel, if you like the content, like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.